morning, everyone, and welcome to the November ID IIDR rounds. Um, I hope it was easier to get up for the rounds now that we've had our, our fallback time change. Um, you're probably tired anyways, because if you're like us, we stayed up and <laughs> tried to see who was going to win this election in the US, and it looks like that's going to take a considerable amount of time to sort out. But in the meantime, we forge on trying to deal with infectious diseases. So I am very happy to uh, introduce our speakers today. Um, our first speaker is Ali Zhang. So he is a MD PhD candidate in biochemistry. He did his undergrad and masters at Western and is now doing his uh, PhD portion of his degree in Matt Miller's lab at McMaster. Uh, he, his project involves studying how broadly neutralizing antibodies work in combination with antiretroviral, antiviral therapies against virus, influenza virus infections. Sorry, Ali, haven't had enough coffee yet. Uh, our second speaker is Mark Lowe. Uh, Mark is professor of medicine and pathology and molecular medicine at McMaster and the division director for infectious diseases. Uh, his research focuses on cluster randomized trials of influenza vaccines in heterite children to demonstrate herd immunity, an international randomized trial of influenza vaccine to prevent adverse vascular events, which he's going to talk about today, a randomized trial on the effect of face masks to prevent COVID-19, and a cohort study in heterite colonies to assess transmission of COVID-19 in children and the effect of pre-existing immunity as a correlative protection. So uh, each speaker is gonna give us about a 20 minute talk and we're gonna hold the questions till the end. So if you have questions, please type them in the Q and A and I will relay them to the speakers. Um, if we don't get time to answer all the questions during the, um, the hour or hour and a bit, um, you may be able to get the speakers to answer your questions by text. All right, without further ado, Ali, if you wanna share your screen. And look forward to your talk. Can you see this okay? Yep. Perfect. All right, so thank you for the uh, introduction, Dr. Burroughs. Uh, today I'm just going to give a brief presentation on my uh, main PhD project, which is um, on the development of broadly protective and combinatorial antibody therapies against uh, influenza virus infections. So just starting off, uh, influenza, it's a very common disease. Uh, in fact, the seasonal flu results in millions of cases of severe illnesses and hundreds of thousands of deaths across the world uh, every year. Uh, every few decades, uh, there are also pandemics that seemingly roll around, uh, the most famous of which is probably the 1918 Spanish flu that killed about 40 to 50 million people worldwide. Influenza is uh, caused by influenza virus infections, and these viruses are enveloped negative sense segmented single stranded RNA viruses. Uh, you can see a diagram of the virus uh, to the right of the screen. So for today's talk, I'd like to focus on the two major surface proteins, uh, hemagglutinin and muraminidase. Uh, so hemagglutinin or HA is shown in blue. Uh, this is the receptor that the virus uses to bind to sialic acids on the host cell during the initial stages of a viral infection. Neuraminidase, on the other hand, shown in orange, uh, is an enzyme that the virus uses to cleave sialic acids off of hemagglutinin as the virus is budding away from the infected cell during the later stages of the viral life cycle. Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase also determine the virus subtype. So when you hear something like H1N1 or H3N2, that denotes the subtype of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase that the virus is expressing. So taking a closer look at hemagglutinin, uh, this protein uh, actually contains two domains, the head domain and the stalk domain. So the head domain is shown in red, the stalk domain is shown in blue, and over here in like a beige semicircle is, uh, is the virus particle, uh, not the scale. So the head domain is the domain that actually does the binding to sialic acids uh, on the host cells. This domain is also the target of antibodies that are raised by uh, conventional vaccines, so the seasonal flu shot. The way that these antibodies work is that they bind, they block the binding rather uh, between HA and sialic acid. So the virus, it's, it's more difficult for the virus to infect a cell in the first place. 
Unfortunately, the head domain of hemagglutin also has uh, abundant genetic variability, so it mutates very quickly. Um, so you can imagine that most antibodies that bind to one strain uh, of the virus won't be able to bind to another strain. The stock domain, on the other hand, uh, in blue, uh, this part undergoes conformational change during the viral entry process. So it kind of mushrooms outwards to bring the viral membrane closer to the host uh, membrane uh, during the membrane fusion process. This domain is also the target of broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, that are raised by some universal vaccines that are currently in development. So the way that these antibodies work is very different from the ways that the head antibodies work, and I'll go into detail about how these antibodies work later on in the presentation. A benefit of targeting the stock domain is that it's much less variable between different virus subtypes. So when you have uh, one of these antibodies, it's likely that it'll also bind to other uh, influenza virus strains. Uh, so neuraminidase, uh, again, this is uh, the other major surface protein. This is an enzyme that binds to and cleaves sialic acids from hemagglutinin from the during the viral budding process. It also helps cleave through mucin uh, in the respiratory tract during the initial stages of infection as well. An important part of neuraminidase uh, for this presentation is that it's also a target of, of uh, many antiviral drugs. So for example, oseltamivir is a competitive inhibitor of neuraminidase and you can see the structure of the two are very similar. Uh, so next, I'm just going to take us through a series of animations that show how the broadly neutralizing or hemagglutinin stock binding antibodies work. So on the bottom of the slide, you can see an infected cell in blue. And during the later stages of the viral infection, you can start to see hemagglutinin and neuraminidase being expressed on the cell surface. Next, we have our stock binding antibody here binding to hemagglutinin. And that allows for the recruitment of effector cells immune effector cells with their FC receptors. So these effector cells could be anything like um, macrophages or neutrophils, NK cells, et cetera. When you look closely at this immune interaction over here, we can see two points of contact. The first point of contact is really obvious, and that's between the antibody and the stock domain. The second point of contact is less obvious, and that's between the hemagglutinin head domain and the sialic acids on the effector cells. So you can imagine with both these points of contact, we get a very stable immune interaction, which allows for better receptor clustering and downstream activation of our effector cells. This could be anything like antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, or ADCC, phagocytosis if you're a macrophage, and mitosis if you're a neutrophil. One thing that we must keep in mind is that in this context, neuraminidase is also present, and this enzyme cleaves sialic acids off of HA. So that kind of destabilizes the two points of contact, making it more challenging for the effector cells to activate. So the hypothesis behind uh, my project is that we can use neuraminidase inhibitors to stop this from happening, to restore our two points of contact, and to make effector cells work better uh, with our stock binding antibodies. So I have two uh, main objectives. Uh, first is to determine the role of neuraminidase enzymatic activity on antibody-mediated activation of our effector cells. So this is mostly our in vitro mechanistic uh, experiments. Our second objective is to evaluate the effic efficacy of combining oseltamivir and antibodies together to both prevent and treat clinical signs of influenza virus infection in our mouse model. So this is our in vivo experiments to see how well these two drugs work together. Uh, so starting off with objective one, one of the first things that we wanted to do was to make sure that oseltamivir does uh, do what it's advertised to do, so to stop neuraminidase activity. So here is just a neuraminidase uh, assay. On the y-axis, we have percent activity of neuraminidase. X-axis is increased in concentrations of oseltamivir. And PR8 is an H1N1 virus strain that we've tested. And you can see a nice dose response curve like this. And we tested two more strains of virus, and we saw very similar results. So another Calo9 H1N1, and X31 is an H3N2. We then ran a similar set of experiments, uh, this time looking at viral replication. So instead of neuraminidase activity, we're looking at viral titers. And x-axis is still oseltamivir concentration. You can see more oseltamivir, we also get less viral replication. Again, we repeated this two more times using two more strains of virus, and we saw very similar results. So what we can say here is that oseltamivir does indeed inhibit both neuraminidase activity and viral replication of the three influenza virus strains that we've tested.
what we wanted to do next was to see if the model that I showed you was actually uh, what's happening. Um, so the oseltamivir does indeed help with stock binding antibody mediated activation of our effective cells. So we ran a series of ADCC assays, so antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity. So how these assays work is that at the bottom of 96 ball plate, we have our target cells. So these are the A549 lung alveolar epithelial cells. We infect these guys with our virus of choice. They start expressing the antigens, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. We then add our monoclonal stock binding antibody in addition uh, with also Tamivir. We then add our uh, effector cells, which are a reporter cell line. So these cells are, are nice because they express the FC receptor that is compatible with our antibody. And they also express luciferase as downstream of an NFAT response element. So when this FC receptor gets activated, the cells start expressing luciferase, and that's how we know when the cell has been activated. So again, uh, we tried this experiment with PR8, H1N1, Y-axis this time is fold induction of our effector cells. X-axis is increasing concentrations of our 6F12, which is our monoclonal stock binding antibody. The different colored lines represent different concentrations of oseltamivir that we've added. So in the control where we didn't add any oseltamivir, you can see a dose response curve like so. When we add a little bit of oseltamivir, we can see the curve shift to the left. When we add a bit more, we can see the curve shift upwards, upwards as well as to the left. So increased efficacy as well as potency. We tried this experiment again uh, with two more strains and we saw very similar results. So what I've shown you here is that also Tambir does indeed enhance monoclonal stock binding antibody mediated ADCC of our infected cells. Uh, so the last uh, in vitro experiment I'd like to show you is that instead of using uh, monoclonal stock antibodies, what happens if we use serum from vaccinated donors? So over here um, is a very similar experiment over on the y-axis is fold induction again of our effector cells. And on the x-axis is increasing concentrations of our serum. So the solid lines represent serum alone, whereas the dotted lines represent serum with 10 micromolars of oseltamivir. You can see we still see a nice shift to the left. Again, uh, keeping with the pattern, we tried this with a few more donors. Um, and we saw donor two and donor four shift to the left as well. Donor four less so than donors one and two. Donor three had a very different response. You see, it was, the uh, response to serum alone was very flat. And when we added also Tembier, it seemed to shift the curve upwards. What we did then was we ran an ELISA to test the titer of stock binding antibodies. And you see donor one and donor two have high titers. Donor four has an intermediate, a lower titer. And then a donor three has a low titer. You can see it corresponds fairly well with the shift um, to the titers compared to the ADCC assays. So what we've shown here is that also Tamir also enhances polyclonal stock binding antibody mediated ADCC of our influenza A virus infected cells. So next, I want to move on to our in vivo experiments uh, to see how well these two drugs work together to prevent and treat clinical signs of influenza virus infection in our mouse models. So what we've done here is I'm going to first introduce our groups of mice. Uh, what we've done so far is we've either treated the mice with um, our stock binding antibody or also Tamivir or a combination of two or neither. And then we uh, infected those guys with virus to see what happens. So in the first group of mice, these guys got neither the HA stock binding antibody nor the also Tamivir or the NA neuraminidase inhibitor. Second group of mice uh, got only the stock binding antibody. Third group of mice in green got only also Tamivir and fourth group of mice got both. And the experimental setup is as follows. So two hours before the infection, we gave the mice the antibodies via IP injection. So it's either 6F12, the stock antibody, or an IgG isotype control. We then gavage these mice with either also Tamivir or a PBS control. We then infected all of our mice with a lethal challenge of PR8. And then days one through five, uh, we gavage the mice with either also Tamivir or PBS twice daily. And then we monitored and weighed the mice twice daily, and then the endpoint was defined as 80% of the initial weight. Day 14 was the end of the experiment. So you can see the setup is <clears throat> like, a, like a prophylaxis. So uh, because we're giving the treatment before the infection. So what this uh, model sort of mimics is perhaps during uh, a setting where we have a, a closed, um, perhaps long-term care facility where the um, patients don't respond well uh, to vaccination. So we're seeing if there's an outbreak, if we give uh, either also Tamivir or our stock binding antibody in combination, uh, do these people fare better compared to those uh, 
we don't get both. Uh, so here are the results. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is percent weight on the y-axis. So this is sort of an indicator for uh, how sick the mice are. The more sick they get, the more weight they lose. And on the x-axis is days post-challenge. So how many days after we infected the mice? On the right side is the survival curve. So percent survival and days post-challenge. When we don't give the mice any treatment or negative control mice, they all reach endpoint about day six, day seven. When we give the mice only our stock binding antibody, they don't do much better um, and they all reach endpoint about day six. When we give only awful tamivir, the story changes a little bit. There's a huge uh, morbidity, but mortality, uh, three out of the five mice live to the end of the experiment or don't reach endpoint rather. And then when we give both the antibody as well as also tamivir, you can see the morbidity um, decline I suppose uh, is, is a lot better um, and that the five out of the five mice uh, uh, survive until the end of the experiment. Uh, so we can see here that the combination of oseltamivir and our monoclonal stock many antibodies enhances protection against a lethal influenza virus challenge in uh, our Bob C mice. The next experiment I'd like to show you is very similar to the previous experiment, except this time, instead of prophylaxis, we're shifting our treatments two days later. So this is a, a kind of like a treatment. So we're going to infect the mice and then wait two days and then start our treatment regimen. So in this case, I guess what we're sort of mimicking is, you know, after someone's been exposed uh, to the influenza virus, uh, is it better to give a monotherapy or a combination therapy? And here are the results. Um, so it's a very similar picture when we give either um, antibody or also temperature by itself, there's either a huge, huge morbidity decline. And then in this case, when we give also temperature by itself, instead of three out of the five mice surviving, we only get one of the five mice uh, not reaching endpoint. It's a very similar story when we give combination. So you can see that the mice, again, they barely lose any weight and five out of the five mice stay, uh, I guess they don't reach endpoint until the end of the experiment. So here we show that combination of also tamivir and our monoclonal stock binding antibodies also enhances protection against lethal challenge, even when it's administered two days post infection. The last in vivo experiment I'd like to show you uh, is a little bit different. So this one, instead of using monoclonal stock binding antibodies, what happens if we use serum with either low titers of stock binding antibody or high titers of stock binding antibody? Um, and then we either gave them the serum alone or serum in combination with oseltamivir. This is again in a prophylaxis model where we gave uh, everything before and then we infected. So what this scenario is uh, mimicking, I guess, is a little bit different. Uh, the question we're asking here is, if someone gets the universal vaccine and it does indeed boost high titers of stock binding antibody, will these people be better off um, when we give them oseltamivir? So does oseltamivir work better for patients who have gotten the universal vaccine is, is the question. Uh, so here are, okay, so before we go to the results, I just wanted to show some ELISA data, uh, kind of quantifying the titers of stock binding antibody. So there's the high serum, with the higher titers, low serum with the lower titers, that's the area under the curve. We also did a hemoglobin inhibition assay just to make sure that there's no head binding antibodies uh, against the virus that we're using. Just so we're getting rid of some confounding variables. Uh, so again, here are the results. So these two sets of graphs only show mice that got the serum with a low titer of stock binding antibody. When you look at the morbidity curve, you can see every group of mice, there's a huge uh, morbidity uh, decline. Uh, so a huge drop in weight. In terms of survival, um, it's a lot better if the mice get uh, low serum as well as also tamivir. Four out of the five mice uh, reach the end of the experiment. When we give them high titers of stock binding antibody, in serum form, we can see a very different story. When you look at the morbidity curve, it's, it's a lot better. Uh, so the mice don't get as sick. Uh, similarly, you can see that um, the survival curve also looks better in that all five of the mice survive until the end of the experiment. So what we've shown here is that also tamivir in combination with serum with high broadly neutralizing antibody titers is more effective at preventing influenza clinical signs in our mouse model compared to serum with low stock antibody titers. Uh, just so in summary, uh, what was shown so far is that neuromidase inhibitors do indeed cooperate with monoclonal and polyclonal stock antibodies in eliciting immune effector cell activation. So this is a, the initial uh, kind of diagram that I showed you, and these are some ADCC assays that I've showed you as well. Uh, 
Secondly, we've shown that neuromediase inhibitors do indeed work cooperatively with antibodies to prevent and treat clinical signs of influenza virus infections. Again, this is a mouse model uh, that I've just shared as well. So next, I'd like to move on to some exciting future experiments. Um, so the first thing I'd like to uh, show is that, um, I guess the diagram over here, is that hemagglutinin um, can be divided into two different groups based on the similarity of their stock domains. So group one hemagglutinin have similar stock domains to each other. Group two hemagglutinins have similar stock domains in terms of structure, uh, in terms of uh, sequence as well. The 6F12 antibody that I've used a lot in my project so far is a pan-H1 binding antibody. So it can bind to different strains of influenza virus as long as they express H1. 9H10, on the other hand, is a H3 and H10 binding antibody. So it can, it's a little bit more broad, um, but it can only bind to H3 and H10 within group two. So we at the Miller Lab, we found a, a new and a rare antibody uh, that can bind between groups. So it can bind to both H1 and H3. And this is very rare because of how different the, the, the stock, bind, the stock uh, domain is between the two groups. So what we want to do is we want to investigate this antibody a bit further. Uh, first, we want to purify it. We want to do some more ELISAs, do some more HAIs to verify the stock domain. Um, secondly, we want to run it, run this antibody through a gauntlet of ADCC assays, combining with also Tamvir, which is using the antibody by itself. Last thing we want to do is put into our mouse models with also Tamvir alone um, or with, uh, with the antibody. So we want to see if there's any potential uh, therapeutic potential, I guess, with this antibody. The next thing we want to do is to do some serial pathogen experiments. And the reason we want to do this is because also time of year by itself is a very good prophylaxis. However, we don't want to just kind of give it to everyone because we're worried that perhaps there's a, there's a, a possibility that there'll be resistance strains that are made. So we're going to test if we combine also time of year with stock binding antibodies, would that either slow down or perhaps even eliminate the potential that resistance strains can emerge. How we're going to do this, we're going to infect some cells with our influenza A virus. We're going to then uh, replenish the media, replace the media to contain either some stock binding antibodies, some awful tamivir or a combination of both. We're gonna wait 48 hours, wait for the virus to grow in the presence of antibody or antiviral drug. We're going to wait 48 hours and put that media containing the virus into fresh cells, replenish our drug or antibody and then just kind of continue the cycle over and over and over again. So let the virus kind of grow either in the presence of antibody, antivirals, or both. We're then going to kind of analyze what we get from the different passages using either plaque assays to measure viral titer or high throughput sequencing of progeny virus to look at the mutations that they've, uh, they've accumulated. Uh, so that's all I have today. Uh, so thank you to everyone uh, for listening, as well as thank you to the Miller Lab, my graduate committee, and my uh, funding sources, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, just to remind our audience, uh, if you can type your questions into the question and answer box, uh, we'll answer the questions uh, together at the end. So thanks, Ali, for that great talk. And I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen so that we can switch over to Mark. OK, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, looks good. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. So I'm just going to go through uh, basically a story of what we've been doing with respect to uh, influenza and the heart. So I'll just, you know, I'll be sort of mixing and matching between background studies and studies that we've previously done just to build up to a randomized control trial that we're currently doing. So to start off, uh, the background for cardiovascular disease, it's uh, it's really, it's a leading cause of death globally. It's estimated to cause about 18 million deaths annually. Uh, patients with heart failure are, are at very high risk. 50% of them die within five years. So it's a, it really is an incredible burden. Uh, and on top of that, additional 30% of patients with heart failure experience myocardial infarction, stroke, and hospitalization due to heart failure annually. So a huge burden, and um, you know, as you've heard from Ali, there's a huge burden of influenza, annual epidemics costs up to a billion cases a year, three to five million cases of severe influenza illnesses. It's estimated that there are between 300 and 650 deaths uh, worldwide. So it's a leading cause of vaccine preventable deaths. So 
one of the questions is is first how you you know how do you put these together uh, who started you know looking at this and uh, one group that started looking at it pretty seriously was uh, was led by Tom Reichardt and they looked at the relationship between influenza and uh, winter increase in death in the United States from 1959 to 1999 and, and what they found is just through these um, looking at these data is there was just a, a superimposed increase in mortality due to ischemic heart disease, um, cerebrovascular death, and diabetes. It was superimposed on those peaks of influenza. And um, as a control, there was no effect of cancer. And when they looked at the H3N2 seasons, the, the death rates was higher. So suggesting a link between uh, the two, a particular between flu and cardiovascular ischemic heart disease and cerebrovascular uh, disease. So I won't uh, bore you a lot with this. You've uh, seen the slides of the flu virus. Just to remind you, there's two types, A and B, and uh, subtypes of A or H3 and 2 and H1 and 2 lineages of B. So what about this link between uh, cardiovascular disease and influenza? Well, there have been uh, a number of what's called self-controlled case series design uh, used to evaluate dissociation between lab-confirmed flu and hospitalization for acute myocardial infarction. One of these studies was uh, done by Jeff Kwong and colleagues, and essentially it's an analysis where the, the analysis is anchored by uh, the influenza detection rate. So what uh, Jeff used was an administrative database linked to a laboratory database and looked at rates of influenza, uh, looked at detection rates of, of flu, the, the time when a specimen was taken, and as cases looked at a risk interval of seven days following the, this was a hospitalization, this was uh, detection of flu and hospitalization for acute myocardial infarction. And the control interval was about a year prior to detection of the a, a flu or other respiratory specimen, a year before or a year after. And basically it's relatively simple because you just count events within this risk period um, and compare that to the control. So you end up with a number of events or uh, acute myocardial infarctions. Uh, ver over over time, and uh, what Jeff and colleagues found was about a six-fold incidence of uh, risk following flu, uh, flu uh, infection. So looked at uh, influenza. They also looked at other respiratory viruses, and you could see that the effect uh, was increased when they narrowed the window to one to three days. But then it started, to, you know, going down uh, as you increase that that window suggesting a sort of almost a, a dose effect, a temporal effect uh, of the influenza infection on, uh, on acute myocardial infarction hospitalization. And this wasn't the only study that's done that. There's been three or four in the literature. Uh, this is a uh, summary of a paper from uh, Europe where they did, did the same thing. Interestingly though, they didn't only look at flu in this study, they looked at pneumococcus and they found the same thing. They found four outcomes like acute myocardial infarction and stroke, uh, an effect where there's, there's right after falling the pneumococcus, people are at risk of those uh, and they looked for other respiratory viruses and they found similar, uh, similar pretty high effect sizes. So uh, our first study looking into this was a number of years ago where we said, well, let's look at, there, there were a number of studies looking at uh, counting, basically at people who had, had looked at hospitalizations uh, with, for heart failure during influenza season, but no one really had looked at patients with heart failure, what their own risk was. So we reached out to, uh, to Salim Youssef, who had this huge uh, database of ran uh, randomized controlled trials. These are sort of classic studies known, uh, known as the solved uh, studies. So we, we got that uh, database from, uh, from Salim and we reached out to, uh, to CDC. At that time, it was uh, KG uh, um, Fucata who said, sure, we'll, we'll give you the rates of influenza across the United States. So, so you can actually model the effect of uh, exposure 
of influenza during the influenza season and compare that to the non-influenza season. So this was work done by Carolyn Sandoval, who was a uh, clinical epidemiology student at McMaster at, at the time. So what Carolyn did was looked at the exposure of flu versus non-flu, and then we, we used other databases to look to adjust for temperature, we adjusted for the trial, age, comorbidities, uh, within the trial, what medication they were on, whether, whether they were on enalapril or placebo. And as you can see over here, there was a, as a, you know, an increase, 11% increase in risk of exposure uh, for those uh, patients with, with heart failure, they were at increased risk of hospitalization. And people have postulated a, very, uh, a number of different mechanisms for this relationship between either uh, ischemic heart disease or admission to hospital for heart failure or exacerbation of heart failure after having the flu. And some have been relatively straightforward, like increase in metabolic demand, exacerbating underlying cardiac conditions, or unregulated sympathetic activity that worsens heart failure. Other people have postulated that it might be a pro-inflammatory cytokine elevation during infection that precipitates plaque rupture or some sort of endothelial cell dysfunction. And there have even been autopsy reports from flu deaths showing acute myocarditis, my, myocarditis and necrosis direct infection, which is probably relatively rare. Um, and then I guess the, the next question becomes if there's you know, this body of, of evidence showing a, a link between the flu and these adverse vascular events, what about uh, flu vaccination? Does it do anything? So this is a study uh, again, that we partnered with uh, Salim Youssef and the group at PHRI to actually do an analysis uh, where, uh, you know, many years ago, we, we sort of said, let's, uh, within these, some of these trials, let's get self-reported flu data. So people would self-report whether they got a flu infection. And this was a study led by uh, Jen, uh, Jenny Johnstone, who uh, looked at the effect of uh, self-reported flu vaccination in participants in these randomized controlled trials uh, using a, a composite outcome of cardiovascular death, uh, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, uh, to look at the effect of, uh, of flu vaccination. And, and Jenny looked at various seasons, and some of these seasons had a good match between the antigen that was in the vaccine and the strain that was circulating, uh, and others didn't. So this was 2003-2004 uh, was not a good match, but if you look at these others, there's a sort of a substantial risk reduction in those individuals who had self-reported getting the, the flu vaccine during influenza season. What was a little surprising though was that effect lingered on to the summer. And this perhaps suggests that uh, either there's a, a post-flu <laughs> post uh, effect or it could be just residual confounding. So other people have done the similar type of uh, uh, epidemiologic studies. This is a group that uh, was led uh, by uh, investigators at Harvard. We used a similar large database, the randomized controlled trial uh, group of patients with, uh, with chronic heart failure. And they asked the same question, what, what, uh, what is the effect of exposure to influenza vaccine? And interestingly, they found a, a risk reduction with all-cause death um, but they didn't really have see a significant effect with uh, cardiovascular death. In fact, all hospitalization, all cause hospitalization, um, was increased in those people who got the uh, the flu vaccination. And they they surmised perhaps that this was just a uh, you know it was, it was a multi country study and and it was just a, an indicator of let's say early hospitalization. Um, but overall, they didn't really find a, an effect. And uh, more recently, investigators have done systematic reviews and meta-analysis, really looking at uh, patients with uh, heart failure to say, if we compare patients with heart failure, what, what are the outcomes uh, between people who've gotten the flu vaccine and those who, uh, who haven't? And in this systematic review, they looked at all-cause death, all-cause mortality, and they found a significant 20%, uh, about a 20% reduction. Uh, when they looked at uh, cardiovascular mortality, there wasn't a significant effect. 
And when they looked at the all-cause hospitalization, there wasn't really a significant effect. So, you know, the question is, what, what's really going on in patients with heart failure? Do they, they actually do they benefit or or not from a flu uh, vaccination? And is you know if 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 it's going to reduce all-cause mortality, is that some sort of uh, is that some sort of uh, selection bias because it's not uh, having much of an effect on these you know more specific outcomes of cardiovascular mortality. And in fact, there's a, there's a long list of studies that now have been criticized because of selection bias. This is a, a study that, uh, again, sort of summarized some of these effects for hospitalization for pneumonia and influenza, hospitalization for cardiac causes, hospitalization for cerebral vascular causes, hospitalization for any cause in death. And you can see that there's always sort of a substantial, pretty substantial risk reduction. And the question has always been, is this really real and people have uh, challenged this this is a now famous study by lisa jackson uh, from seattle that suggested uh, evidence of bias in estimates of influenza effectiveness in uh, seniors basically the idea was to um, do something a bit sneaky and, and uh, look at uh, the relationship between flu vaccine and all-cause mortality and pneumonia and influenza hospitalization before the flu season. And Lisa showed that there was a reduction in all-cause death and hospitalization due to pneumonia and influenza before flu was, was even circulating, suggesting that there is a, uh, a bias that it's just, uh, all it's showing is people who are healthy are getting the flu and they're, and they're doing better than those people who aren't so healthy. So when you have this sort of uh, situation, really you want to start relying on randomized controlled trials. Um, generally speaking, when you're talking about interventions, to prove interventions, um, you, you really want RCTs as we've seen with COVID-19. So this is a meta-analysis uh, done by uh, Jay Udell and uh, colleagues that looked at a number of well, relatively small studies that uh, randomized uh, patients to the flu vaccine or no flu vaccine, they weren't all placebo controlled. And it was sort of a mixed bag of, uh, of rigor in terms of the, uh, the studies. Um, but overall, you could see a substantial effect size, right? Uh, about uh, uh, over 30% uh, risk reduction uh, due to the influenza vaccine. And the question is this, is this real or not? And so um, that's where we got into saying, okay, you know, we really want to do or should be doing uh, a randomized controlled trial of influenza vaccine to reduce adverse vascular events. So uh, again, we partnered with uh, Salim and his colleagues and uh, did an international trial and are con continuing to do it. We're gonna finish, uh, finish it up pretty, uh, pretty soon. Um, and we had to go through, you know, the, the funding cycle. CHR told us to take a hike, but eventually we got funding from uh, from the MRC in the UK to do this randomized controlled trial. And um, this figure just summarizes what we're doing. So uh, we've enrolled over 5,000 participants now from various international sites. So we're looking at uh, adults who have a clinical heart failure. We exclude individuals who have some sort of contraindication to the flu vaccine. And we're also ex excluding people who've been, uh, who sort of uh, repeat uh, vaccinators. So we exclude people who've had uh, influenza vaccine in the recent past. And we also exclude individuals who are candidates for surgical percutaneous uh, valve repair. So people whose risk would change over the course of the study are excluded. And we've randomized them to an activated influenza vaccine that is uh, Vaxigrip. We chose Vaxigrip because it's licensed in many different countries. So pragmatically, it was the, the way to go. Um, in the control group, the, the participants uh, get uh, saline vaccine, but we've also allowed them to get uh, the flu shot outside of the trial if they're uh, interested in, in that. And the outcome is a primary outcome. Uh, it's a composite outcome of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, and hospitalization for heart failure. And what we do, what we've been doing, is following them up for over uh, three seasons. So this is a just synopsis of the sites. There are uh, five sites in uh, in Africa that uh, that are participating. It's uh, 
uh, Uganda, Mozambique, Kenya, Zambia, and uh, Nigeria. Uh, we've got sites in the in the Middle East, UAE, and Saudi Arabia, and also sites in India, the Philippines, and uh, and China. And there are there have been two other randomized controlled trials uh, that are similar, not exactly the same. Uh, this is a European trial. That looks with looks at uh, that's been looking at people with an, some sort of acute coronary syndrome, and right after they're um, they're identified, they're randomized to flu vaccine or uh, or placebo. Uh, and the other study is called the Invested Study. This is led by a group at Harvard that uh, have been looking at it's a bit of a different question than, than ours, but looking at the difference between a high dose flu vaccine and, uh, and a standard dose. Um, this study was stopped early. Uh, I believe it was for, uh, for futility. I'm not really sure about that, but uh, um, that's really it. So at this point, I don't think, I believe the European study is always, has, has already uh, stopped. So ours, I think, is the only ongoing uh, clinical trial addressing this question. Uh, and one of the interesting things, it's interesting, but it's, I guess, a challenge in a way, is the fact that uh, since we're doing it in such uh, diverse geographic locations that the, the flu season changes. So this is the uh, prototypical North American sort of uh, November to April uh, epidemic curve for flu. Um, but in the Philippines, for example, our peak time starts uh, uh, in the spring and they're followed towards the fall. So we've, we've had to learn a lot about the, uh, the global epidemiology of influenza. And it's not really as straightforward as a northern versus southern hemisphere. It's really when are the peaks and the peaks tend to be in some places they're in the fall and some places they tend to be uh, in the spring or early summer. Uh, we've, uh, you know, been uh, again vaccinating people in in uh, in Africa. So the countries there, they tend to have. It's, there's not that much seasonality. There tend to be flu cases all uh, all around the, the season. So we've basically taken advantage of that and established two cohorts: one in the fall and uh, one in the spring to boost uh, enrollment. Uh, China has been another sort of interesting. Uh, type of place for uh, flu epidemiology because it, it looks uniform on an epidemic curve, but it really is variable depending on, on where you're, uh, you're uh, doing the study. We've been doing it in uh, northern parts of, of China. Uh, and India is another one where there's going to be a lot of variability. Some places have a peak from April to May. Sometimes it's in September to, uh, to October. Um, so we've spent a lot of time uh, working with some colleagues at WHO who tried to give us as much data as they have, uh, particularly from uh, in African countries. And we look at graphs like this to sort of time uh, the, the start and the stop of the, uh, of the flu season. So that's important because when we finalize a trial, we certainly want to be counting events during the, uh, during the flu season. So our cumulative enrollment is shown here. It's uh, in January 2019, we were over 5,000. So right now it's just uh, in uh, sort of follow-up mode. So why is this study important? Well, I showed you there's a huge uh, burden of disease in, due to cardiovascular illness. The uptake of flu vaccine in these high-risk groups is relatively low. Uh, the effect size being tested that we're testing in the trial is comparable to other secondary prevention strategies for patients with heart failure. It might change thinking about prevention if, if we get a, a hit. Uh, and it's also a randomized controlled trial in very diverse geographic uh, locations. Uh, future direct directions, well, it depends on what we find. It possibly, I've shown you the, the links between pneumococcal disease and um, cardiovascular events. So possibly a randomized controlled trial of pneumococcal vaccine, uh, effect of looking at new formulation formulations of flu vaccine, the effect of herd immunity, cohort studies using biomarkers to understand mechanisms, et cetera. And the last slide is just funding acknowledgements by uh, MRC. And uh, because that funding is run out using my foundation grant. So that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, that was really interesting. Um, I'm actually going to start off asking you the first question because I've heard that because of all the universal health precautions that people are taking that the flu incidence is not going to be as high. Is that what you guys are seeing? Um, are you directing that to me? Um, Sorry, yes. um, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I think it's a bit too early to say myself, um, Laurie, about what the uh, what the flu season is going to be like. Uh, it's uh, I don't I don't think there's enough surveillance right now to to say. I, I you know I think it would be interesting to see what uh, what pans out. So um, I, I think for us it's too early to uh, to pontificate on that question myself. Other people might have different ideas. Okay. Um, we have a question for Ali um, from Dr. Miller. Uh, he says, based on your serum transfer experiment, is it possible that existing differences, um, independent of a universal vaccine in your antibody titers, could explain the differences in the effectiveness of a, of a neuraminidase inhibitor between patients? So in other words, can you use uh, broadly neutralizing antibody titers to predict how well the neuraminidase inhibitor will work? Um, I, I think so, yeah. So there's there's a lot of different reasons why ozotamivir might work um, better in some patients um, and not so much in other patients. So existing titers of broadly neutralizing antibodies that someone has could certainly be one of them. Um, so, you know, someone could have higher titers to stop by antibodies or lower titers based on their, you know, vaccine history or influenza virus infection history. Um, so perhaps someone with higher titers to stop by an antibody, um, maybe they get better effective cell activation when we combine it, when they get also Tamivir uh, compared to someone who doesn't. So in addition to the effects of also Tamivir having on the virus, it can also get better immune activation as well. Um, in terms of uh, efficacy for also Tamvir, I think one of the more uh, important factors is what time, um, the timing that the, that the patient has got the drug. So these antiviral drugs typically work much, much better when they're given earlier on uh, during the infection. And uh, the reason for that is because the, the, earlier on during the infection, that's when the virus is actively replicating. And later on during the disease is when the immune system kind of takes over. And a lot of the symptoms that you see could be explained um, that are immune mediated. So uh, if someone got the drug much earlier on, uh, that could be a, an even more important factor to whether or not oseltamivir is effective. Um, can I ask you why oseltamivir and not other neuramidase, neuramidase inhibitors? Why is that the drug of choice? Um, there's, so oseltamivir, we chose this one because the other one, zanamivir and paramivir, one of them is uh, IV. I believe Zanamivir is IV. And then the last one, what well, could be mistaken, one of them is, is inhaled. Um, also, Tamivir is taken orally. The reason we chose this one was because we wanted to do some mouse experiments. It's a lot easier to gavage than to, mm -hmm. I guess, nebulize or to do an IV injection. Um, it's also, I guess it was also available when we we're looking. So that's the one that we kind of stuck with. And, and have you guys considered, um, rather than having to do a combination therapy to, um, use, I guess, passive immunization with a broadly neutralizing antibody that is modified in a way that it can bind to other uh, receptors on effector cells. In other words, can you overcome the, the loss of sialic acid by appending something else that will attract effector cells? We've done the opposite. So we've actually used an antibody that can't bind to the FC receptor at all. Um, and we showed that that antibody uh, it doesn't doesn't work at all. So it's kind of like it's it's basically as if you just didn't give an antibody. So these stock binding antibodies they really really do need the FC FC receptor interaction. Um, in terms of increasing the strength of the FC FC receptor, um, I think that's something. I think Dr. Rulo is working on something that kind of makes that a little bit stronger. Um, but I think it's certainly it's certainly an interesting avenue to explore. We haven't tried it yet, no. Okay. Uh, There's a question from David Clark. Uh, I recall some reports in the last century suggesting neuramid neuramidase treatment could render non-immunogenic 
tumor cells immunogenic. Does your neuromidase treatment enhance ADCC for some effector cells and not others? Um, Non-immunogenic tumor cells immunogenic. Does the ADCC? Hmm. In other words, that... it's, unmasking, it's unmasking the cells. That I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So another thing is that ADCC is only one of the effector cells that we've measured. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier on in the presentation, there's also you know, mitosis that's being activated by neutrophils that we haven't measured, phagocytosis by macrophages or cytokine secretion that we haven't measured either. Um, so ADCC is only, only one of the many effector cell functions that, that happen. Um, in terms of answering your question, I'm, I'm not too sure. We haven't, really, we haven't really tested any other effective cells, to be honest. All right. Um, I have one more question for Mark. Um, so you mentioned that there's been one study where they compared low dose and high dose. And I, I was just wondering, is how much does the composition of the vaccine influence the uh, protective effects? Um, well, the, you know, I mean, the composition in terms of the antigens, it, you know, it, this is the problem during these flu trials. If you're, if it's a low season, first of all, um, you can be out of luck. You, you might be underpowered, but if there's not a good match between, you know, this is just one reason there's egg adaptation. There's a, there's a number of reasons, but one of them is just match. So if for whatever reason, there's not a good um, either there's uh, an issue with the uh, egg adaptation or a poor match between the antigens in the vaccine and the strain that's circulating, you're going to have less of, you know, you'll have less of an effect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, again, I, I don't know, we'll find out very soon, but I suspect that uh, the study was was stopped because because of futility. So for us, it's it's sort of, okay, this is, you know, what's our study going to show, right? So we're, uh, <laughs> we're eager to to complete it and just see um, how our results uh, sort of pan out. Um, we are having very high event rates, though. So, um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a uh, group of people who have, you know, high rates of hospitalization and mortality. So I don't think it's an issue of not having high event rates. Uh, one, one of the challenges, though, will be to make sure that, you know, when we're counting events, we're doing it based on the epidemiology. In other words, if you start to count events in a clinical trial, when there's no flu that's circulating, you can't expect to see an effect of flu vaccine, right? So if you're going to say, you know, you, you want your analysis done during certain time periods when flu is circulating, you have to do that before you unlock the data. Mm -hmm. so that's what we're doing right now is we're just looking at um, when those flu seasons started and stopped because that could be uh, or what we call it, a sort of a threat to, to, to validity and reduce our ability to see uh, an effect. Okay, and in, in addition to the, just the match of the vaccine to the circulating virus, does, was there any um, effect of different adjuvants, for example? So, you know. Oh, well, there, it wasn't in, uh, in, in terms of the, this trial. So uh, none of these trials that I've been describing have been uh, an adju adjuvanted vaccine trial. So we are completing uh, an adjuvanted trial in children right now. And we're, we're, you know, we're analyzing the data. So in children between the ages of six months and six years. So the story with adjuvants is that, you know, it's licensed for younger children and for older adults. The real story with ad, uh, adjuvants is there's been no head-to-head um, -head comparison between a high-dose vaccine and an adjuvanted vaccine in, in a randomized clinical trial. So we've been, you know, pestering the Ontario Ministry for the last, I don't know, four years now to allow us to do this trial because we have, we have, you know, we have funding to do it and uh, we, we have ethics approval. It's just a question of getting them to agree to, uh, to doing this. So I think we're, we're close. I think the, the pandemic has uh, just put a, a bit of a knot in that plan, but uh, I think eventually we'll be able to do that. So just do a cluster randomized control trial in uh, older residents of nursing homes. Interesting. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any further questions. So I guess we're going to wrap up for today. So thank you both again for really interesting talks and hopefully 
with all the masking and hand washing that's going on, the flu will be <laughs> less of an issue this year because we already have our hands full. All right, thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see you next month for December's talk.